Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. He's alive. Amen. Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter number 23. One of the more powerful statements of the Lord. Uh, we are coming to the conclusion now for these last seven weeks. Uh, we have uh, been looking at the last words of Jesus. Today we're at the last of the last words. I suspect I have heard more people's last words than maybe um, this entire congregation combined. My mama, her last words to me were, I love you. My dad's last words on this earth were, does Mike know? Um, but the more famous, the most famous of all last words is found right here in this passage. When Jesus said with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then the Bible says, having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly, this was a righteous man. Can you imagine that centurion and what he heard that day as the Lord Jesus cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this soldier at the foot of the cross thought, you know, I've done this a hundred times. I've never heard a criminal say anything like that before. And then as Jesus turned to a criminal beside him and said, today, you will be with me in paradise. And I suspect this soldier said, what? What do you mean taking somebody with you to paradise? And then when Jesus, in the midst of his pain and his suffering, instead of focusing in on himself like every other one crucified would have done, he said, John, take care of my mother. And mama wants you to go home with John, let him take care of you. And that centurion at the foot of the cross thought to himself, my goodness, everybody else is always focused in on their own needs and here he is taking care of the needs of other people. And then he heard him say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And this centurion came away with the conclusion this is a righteous man. Surely he is who he said that he was. We're going to be looking today at the death of Jesus and how these last words relate to us what kind of heavenly father that we really have in glory. Now I want you to notice three things about the death of Jesus. First of all, it was a voluntary death. If you look at John chapter 10, uh, Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. He laid it down on a Friday evening and he picked it back up on a Sunday. He did what he said he was going to do. He died a reverend death. He was quoting scripture in Psalm 31 uh, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His focus of attention was not on himself. His focus of attention was on his heavenly father. And he was praying a little Jewish prayer that he had learned at his mama's lap from the word of God. He died a voluntary death. He died a reverend death. And third, he died confidently. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit here. I am trusting you with my spirit. Here's the neat thing about it. The scriptures tell us that he didn't just whisper it. Now, you've got a guy on the cross here uh, with 360 lacerations across, across his body, uh, nails in his hands and in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, a spear had already thrust through his side. You would have thought by now he couldn't muster up a whisper, but the Bible says that not only did he say it, he shouted it, Father, can you imagine? I commend my spirit. And people have been repeating this little prayer 
for the last 2,000 years. One of the things that I know in my heart today is that there are a lot of you that have come on this Easter Sunday in 2021. Many of you are watching through live stream and you're going through some of the most difficult days that you've ever gone through in your life. Some of you are suffering tremendous grief. Others are going through some physical pain or job separation or family dilemma. You're facing financial crisis or some issue that's going on. I want to pull out to you four truths out of this passage. Each word is so power packed full of truth that I want to just kind of share with you. Uh, God can help you through the difficulty and the tough times that you're facing. The first thing that I see here is that he is a compassionate father. I was talking to one of our members just recently and he was sharing with me, he said, pastor, you know, the most difficult thing about my Christian life is that I have had to gain a new concept of what fatherhood is all about. He said, I grew up with a dad uh, that was wicked and vile. I, I, I grew up with a dad uh, who was so unlike what I've learned that God is like. And I had to have a different concept of who God, my father, you understand God is a caring God. God is a compassionate God. Uh, God is a present God. Some of you feel like that maybe God has abandoned you, but God is not fickle. God is not moody. God is not absent. He is right with you and he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He loves you more than anybody else you could ever imagine. He cares about everything in your life and the neat thing about it is he's got the power to help you through everything that you may be facing in this life. The Bible says in Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who honor him. So Jesus begins his final comments there on the cross with a great tribute to a caring, compassionate, loving Heavenly Father. Now, the second attribute is that I want you to understand about God. He is completely faithful. You can trust him. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Powerful words. Um, you, you know, one of life's greatest questions is uh, who are you going to trust? And once you decide who you're going to put your trust in, uh, then ultimately decides whether or not you're going to be happy or miserable, whether or not you're going to have a life that is complete or you're going to waste your life. So who are you going to trust? Let's look at our options for just a minute. You're going to trust Congress? What was it Reagan said many, many years ago? Most dangerous words that could ever be said is your government is here to help you. Um, you're going to trust Congress? What's their track record like? You're going to trust the media? My word. You're going to trust the culture and the culture is changing about every hour on the hour? And so who are uh, you going to trust? You're going to say, well, I'm going to tell you what, Pastor. I, I've learned I'm going to trust myself. I, I'm just going to go by my gut instincts. Really? How's that working for you so far? I, I think it's ridiculous to think that you can trust yourself because the fact of the matter is uh, we can be easily manipulated. All you got to do is sit in front of the television and the television is geared to manipulate people. Uh, you can be manipulated by a bad taco that'll attack your feelings one night and you're going to be miserable. <laughs> you know that there are people that specialize in manipulating other people. So you can't trust yourself. Uh, I, I know I can't trust myself. If somebody hurts me, one of the first things I want to do is be unforgiving. But I know that being unforgiving of other people is only going to hurt me. And so instead of doing what I feel like I want to do, which is to get even, I have to do the right thing. Major difference. So you got to trust somebody. So who can you trust? Uh, maybe it's better to trust somebody that knows everything that there is to know about you. Uh, maybe it's better to trust somebody who always does the perfect thing. Uh, maybe it's better to trust somebody uh, who will never lie to you. And so all of a sudden you have reduced 
the gene pool out there to eliminate everybody else and the only person that's left is God himself. I was talking to a young lady last night in our service. She came down and she'd given her heart and life to Jesus and I asked her the question, will God ever tell you a lie? And she looked at me, her eyes that big, and she says, no. You don't understand, God will never lie to you. He may say some things to you that you don't like and that you don't want to hear, but the truth will set you free. The Word of God says, for the Word of the Lord holds true, and everything He does is worthy of our trust. Back in the late 70s and 80s, there was this phrase going around, God said it, uh, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, there's a big problem with that statement. When God says it, it doesn't matter whether I believe it or not, it just settles it because his word uh, is true. Uh, my wife and I have a uh, safety deposit box. How many of you have a safety deposit box? Let me see your hands. Hold up. Good night. Okay. We have a safety deposit box. Do you know the reason that people have safety deposit boxes? You know what goes in there? Things go in there that are precious. Things that go in there, you, you don't want to have somebody come in and break into your house and steal it. You don't want your house to burn down and it be burned up with it. Uh, you want to put something in there that's not going to rust or rot or decay. And so you put it in that safety deposit box for safekeeping. And Jesus said, Father, into your hands I make this deposit. May I say to you, all of you here today, whatever it is that you give to God, whatever it is you entrust to him, whatever it is you commit to him, God's going to keep it safe. He's going to take care of it. So what do you need to entrust to him today? What are you worried about? You know that worry is actually practical atheism. When God has saturated his word with promise after promise after promise to all of his children and you say, you know what, I know that that promise is there, but all of a sudden you said, God, I can't trust you with this. In other words, God, I, I, I don't believe you in this. But what do you need to entrust to him? What worry, what anxiousness, what problem do you need to turn over to the Lord. You know, one of the most difficult times that people uh, have in trusting God is when they're in the midst of pain. We want to hold on to the pain. We don't want to let go of it. We, we don't believe that we can trust that pain to anybody or anything other than ourselves. Paul knew what that was like. He suffered greatly. Listen to what he said in 2 Timothy 1. He says, I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know in whom I have believed. And I'm convinced, I am persuaded that he's able to guard and to protect and to keep everything that I have entrusted to him. Oh, what a powerful word. There are many of you that are listening today by live stream or by television. And many of you are sitting here under the sound of my voice on this wonderful Easter Sunday morning. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, I would trust my life to Jesus, but I don't know that I could hold out. I, I don't know that I could keep my promise. I don't know that I could stand true to the vow that I would make. So I, I don't give my life to Christ because I'm afraid that I won't keep my promise. You know, when you submit, when you commit, when you deposit your life to Jesus, it's not about you keeping the commitment. It's about what God said he would do with your commitment. I, I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you're going through today. I can just tell you that you have a Father in heaven that can be trusted and you can trust everything to Him. Let me give you number three. You ready? It's God's concealing work. God's concealing work. My wife and I are learning this more and more and more and more every day that God's doing a lot of things behind the scenes that we can't see and that we're not aware of and that we're not familiar with. He's working behind the scenes in ways that would boggle your minds if you knew what was going on there. Notice what Jesus said, Father, 
Into your hands I commit, I deposit what? Say it loud. My spirit. Now what does that mean? It means, ladies and gentlemen, that we are a whole lot more than flesh and bones. There's a lot more to us. One of these days, somebody's going to take your body and they're going to lay it down in the ground and it's going to return to the dust from whence it came. But your spirit is going to live on somewhere forever. You're not going to die. You're going to live somewhere forever, which means that there is a spiritual world, there's a spiritual realm to life that you and I cannot see or touch. But it's going on right now across that spirit world. There is a cosmic battle that is going on for the souls of men, women, boys, and girls. There's a huge battle uh, that is raging right now. This life is not all there is. God is working behind the scenes on your behalf. Uh, one of the uh, first books in the Bible that I ever studied, I know it's kind of weird, but one of the first books of the Bible that I ever studied was the book of Job. And old Job, he lost everything. He had lost his health and his wealth, his family. Everything was gone. He was stripped of everything and he was just totally barren before God. And here's what he said. He said, when he, God, is at work in the north, I don't see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Paul said the same thing just in a different way. Paul said, our light and momentary affliction or troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that outweighs everything. In other words, um, Paul said, I've got problems here that are unbelievable that I'm going through right now. But God has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan that is going to bring eternal rewards to me that I'm going to receive uh, and that I would not have received had I not gone through it. Now watch this. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. By the way, guys, it's just what you focus on. You need to get your eyes off of your circumstances and get them on the Savior who is behind the scenes doing stuff that you cannot imagine. So we focus on the things that are unseen uh, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I can just tell you, I know you're facing tough times. I know you're struggling. I know you're suffering. Oh, but God's doing some stuff so wonderful and so great on your behalf. Focus in on him. Let me give you number four. And, and boy, this is the one that I, I've been waiting for a week now to tell you. And that is God's capacity. He says, Father, into what? Your hands. I commit my spirit. Do you know that God's got big hands? He's got the whole world in his hands. Somebody ought to write a, book, write a, write a song about that. That's just a good <laughs> catchy little phrase, isn't it? Huh? He's got the whole world uh, in his hands. God's hands are big. And they're big enough for you to put every doubt, every question, every pain. He's big enough to hold every complaint. He's big enough to handle whatever it is that you give to him into your hands. I've worked for Sears for about seven years uh, down in Greenville, South Carolina. And inside the Sears building, uh, was all state insurance. See that little phrase, into your hands I commit my spirit. That, that's kind of a catchy phrase that so many folks, do you, do you remember what the slogan is for all state? You're in good hands with all state. Anybody here had all state insurance? Had a couple of wrecks? But I'm going to tell you what, God will never drop you. God will never let you fall out. 
My heavenly father's got big. My, my grandfather, I wish you could have known my grandfather. His nickname was Old Man. Uh, I, I never called him that, I promise you that. Um, but he was a mountain man. He was a logger. I, I grew up on this sawmill. And I don't know how many of you even know these kinds of terms or not, but uh, one of the uh, tools that a logger had was a peavey. Now, we didn't call it a peavey. I don't even remember what we called it, but it, it was a peavey. And it's got this great big old hook on it and, and a little sharp end uh, on the handle. And, and you stick that PV into the log and the hook goes around. And, and with that big old handle, you can just, man, flip that log in, in any kind of direction. Now, I couldn't even pick up the PV. Uh, it, it, but my grandfather, his hands uh, would wrap around that handle and, and he would move those logs around like a toothpick. It was amazing to me how he could do that. My grandfather had huge hands, but I want to tell you, my heavenly father has got big hands and he can handle everything that there is about you. You want a great study? Just go chase down the 200 times in the scripture uh, where the hand of the Lord is used. It's used for our blessing and it's used for our benefit. It's used for our success. It is used for our anointing. And I'm going to tell you, the only explanation for Mike Whitson is the hand of God. It's the only explanation uh, for us. You want God's hand on your life. You want to be in the hand of God. Let, let me give you a couple of things about that, can I? He uses his hands to bless me. I, I, I love reading the New Testament about Jesus and the way that he dealt with people. I, I, the, you know, I've read all of John Maxwell's books on, on how to be a people person, but I want to tell you, the greatest example is Jesus. I love the way that he put his hands on people. He, he would put his hands on the blind and they would see for the first time. He would take that hand and he would put it on a man who had never heard and his ears would be open and he would hear for the first time. I, I watched him as he put his hands on a leper, which was unheard of in those days. You just didn't do that. And that leper was completely cleansed and healed uh, of his leprosy. In Psalm 139, 5, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand on me. His hands will bless me. The other day, um, I was standing here, just finished preaching chapel, and uh, one of the uh, teachers came up to me afterwards, and she said, let me tell you a cute thing that one of my students said the other day. And she came up to me and she said, uh, ma'am, uh, are those holes still in Jesus' hands? May, may I say to you that the only scars that are ever going to be in heaven are the scars of Jesus. You and I are going to receive a perfect body. Not going to be any scars in our body that's going to remind us of any pain and suffering that we go through down here on this earth. Oh, but the scars of Jesus' hands are going to be a huge reminder to him about us. He will never forget you. May, may I say to any of you that you may think that God has abandoned you, that he's forgotten you. I want to tell you, those scars are still there in the hands of Jesus. And he's going to be reminded. He's never going to forget you. He will always remember you. The Bible says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. He'll never forget you. He hasn't forgotten you today. And the third thing is that um, the hands of Jesus are strong enough, well, I like this part, to keep me eternally secure. Greatest lesson after I got saved is knowing that I could never be lost again because God's big enough to keep me secure in him. Powerful words. Every daddy in the room is going to re relate to this. How many of you dads like me? You, you got in a pool one day and you reached up and your kids are on the edge of that pool and you said, jump, jump. 
and they looked at you with these scared, horror-filled eyes. And they finally mustered up. Can you see it? They finally mustered enough courage to leap off the edge of that pool and into your arms to discover my daddy's strong enough to catch me. <laughs> and then for the next hundred times, they... Today, God's got his arms stretched out for some of you. And he's saying, trust me. Trust me. Jump. Leap. I'll catch you. And I promise you this, if you will make that leap, if you will take that jump, if you will exercise that faith, oh, it's so much easier after that to trust him the second time and the third time and the fourth time. Every time that you get afraid, every time that there is a dilemma, every time that you're in a situation, if you just commit, if you just deposit, he's right there with those big old hands. It's amazing what God will do. Um, listen to what Paul says. He says, I, I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard time that we went through in Asia. Some of you going through a hard time. We were really crushed and overwhelmed. Have you ever been there? And feared we would never live through it. Have you ever been there? I'm thinking I'm going to make it through this. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. Paul says we came to the end of ourselves. We tried everything and no matter how hard that we tried, it was never enough and we came to the end of ourselves. His next phrase is powerful. He said, and that was good. I want to say to you, God will bring you to the end of yourself. You can exhaust all human effort. You can wind up crushed with nothing left. And you're thinking, I'm not going to make it. God says, been waiting on you to get there. It's good. For then, we put everything into the hands of God who alone could save us. For even he can raise the dead. <laughs> so when you get to the end of yourself and you're tired of the battle, and you don't have any way out, it's then that you jump into his hands and says, that's a good thing. I can take care of you now. That's what Easter is all about. Father, into your hands we commend our spirit. I want to tell you something you may not know. That was a prayer that every good Jew learned from the time that they could talk. Every night before they would go to sleep, every good Jew would pray that prayer. Father, Come here to the end of the day now and I'm commending my spirit into your hands. Mary taught that to Jesus as a little boy and now he's repeating it back into his father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Did y'all ever have a bedtime prayer? Say it with me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Sound familiar? That little prayer has its roots right into the final words of Jesus. Can I, can I, can I help you with something? Here's what I want you to take home on this Easter. This is not a prayer just for the dying it's for the living. Father, I'm going through some stuff that I never dreamed that I would ever go through in my life. I'm feeling overwhelmed. But I'm commending that to your spirit, Lord. I, I can't handle this anymore. I'm going to give it to you. Father, I'm scared out of my wits. I don't know what to do. But Lord, I'm going to give it to you. This may surprise you about your pastor, it's okay. I'm, 
this week. I'm like some of you. I was faced with one of the biggest decisions that I've ever been confronted with in my life. Probably the biggest decision ever outside of my own salvation. Got overwhelmed. I'm sitting in my study getting ready for today. Got overwhelmed and I said, God, I don't know what to do about this. And and, and Lord, you know, you got to come through for me on this. I'm giving this to you. And I'm telling you in less than five minutes in the word, in the word, wasn't emotional stuff. It was in the word. God answered that for me just like that. Made it clear, plain and unmistakable. God will do that for you if you'll just leap off the edge and let him catch you. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Psalm 31 says, I trust in you, Lord. My times are in your hands. Have you ever leaped off the edge into the arms of Jesus? Have you ever trusted him as your heavenly father? Do you have the assurance today that he lives in you? Maybe God brought you to the place where you are right now that you don't have any place else to turn but him. The word says that's good. (laughs) That's good. And God brought you here today on this Easter 2021 to give you that opportunity to commit yourself to him. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? Would some of you in this room right now realize you don't have any place else to turn but him? And there's no greater person to trust than him. He wants what's best for you. As a matter of fact, this choice that you're about to make is going to be the greatest choice that you'll ever make in your life. And I'm asking you to choose Jesus. And if you're ready to do that, I wonder if you'd pray something like this with me. Would you pray, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sin. Just say that to the Lord. I believe that you rose from the dead on that third day. I know that my sin has separated me from you. And I agree with you about my sin. And right now, with your help, I'll turn away from sin. And today I place my trust in you. Forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.